Uh, let me start by introducing myself. Uh, I'm Christopher Jelpe. I am the, the uh, director of the Mershon Center for International Security Studies. Uh, the Mershon Center is an interdisciplinary center that is focused on uh, promoting knowledge around the uh, creation of international security from uh, international, national and human security um, from different perspectives. And um, we are uh, focused on three different uh, research clusters. Uh, this uh, event here today is being put on by the Recovering from Violence uh, Research Cluster. And uh, this will be the final, uh, our final event uh, of the year in Recovering from Violence. And uh, I want to thank um, the, uh, the, I am also co-leader of the Recovering from Violence group. And I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues, uh, Terry Murphy, Holly Nysif Brem, and Trey Billing, who um, uh, they've, they've carried me through, through the year uh, doing this. And um, uh, it's really been an exciting journey to, uh, to expand uh, the kinds of ways to understand security uh, that I think this cluster has, has begun to build. Um, one of those uh, sort of uh, expanding partnerships that, uh, that we're developing is a, a new uh, partnership with the Divided Communities Project uh, at, the, at the School of Law. And so we at, uh, at Mershon are trying to, through events like this, are trying to bring perspective, international perspectives on divided communities. But we also recognize that we ourselves here live in a divided community. Uh, and so we wanted to uh, connect ourselves to folks who are working on healing those sorts of divides. So I want to um, uh, introduce Carl Smallwood from the uh, Moritz College of Law and from the Divided Communities Project, uh, who we're so happy to partner with uh, here in Columbus as, as we move toward uh, reconciliation. So Carl, uh, thanks, thanks for joining us. And if you want to say a, a, a few words about a divided communities that'd be terrific thank, thank you very much chris <clears throat> and 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 thank you my name is carl smallwood i'm a co-director of the divided community project we assist communities to plan for and to address divisions caused <clears throat> excuse me divisions caused by racial religious immigration and other uh, differences uh, and it has been both a, a privilege and a pleasure to work with Mershon and, and to work with Duncan Morrow on projects related to guiding initiatives like truth and reconciliation types of initiatives related to racial equity for communities in the United States. So we look forward to hearing and, and learning from Duncan's deep insights about constructive ways to de-escalate tension and to identify possible pathways to moving forward in Northern Ireland, because we know the lessons there can be translated to good use in our communities here in the United States. I want to thank Chris uh, and Terry Murphy and Duncan for permitting us to be part of this important program. So Terry, to you. Thank you, Carl. My name is Terry Murphy, and I'm the Associate Director at the Mershon Center and as they say in Northern Ireland, you are all very welcome. Before introducing Duncan, I wanna frame the event for the audience and tell you where we hope to journey in the next hour. To be really honest with you, we had originally imagined this gathering as a small little intimate lunchtime conversation. A couple of weeks ago, pictures of protests in Northern Ireland were spread across the media. There were pictures of lads, throw, you know, 13 and 14 year old lads throwing petrol bombs, police cars overturned. Um, and because we know so many people here in the United States are fond of the island, we decided to pull together a current event talk for so maybe about 20 people. Uh, but to our surprise and delight, already about 130 of you have chosen to attend. And so for this reason, we needed to move to a, a webinar format. Still, we hope that what sits in front of us this next hour will feel accessible, almost like an intimate conversation at the corner pub between two friends. You'll have an opportunity to raise questions at about 1240, a few details. Please use the Q&A function. You'll find it at the bottom, um, the bottom tab there. Um, don't use the chat bar if you wanna ask a question. Um, and 
please ask the questions throughout Duncan's reflections because as a moderator, it's really hard to pick questions if they all come in at the very end. So ask along the way. Um, and if possible, maybe add something a little personal so we can personalize your question. If you're a student, say, you know, my name is, I'm a sociology, uh, my, my major is sociology, I'm in the third year. If you're a faculty, perhaps say your department. And if you're a community member, you know, say I'm, I'm calling in or I'm listening in from whatever city you're in, just to kind of make it a little bit more personal. Once that happens, or once we hit about 1240, um, our postdoc Trey Billing is going to magically appear on the screen, and he will pick some of those questions and um, and and field them uh, to to Duncan. So let's go ahead and turn to the good stuff, which is our conversation today with Duncan Morrow. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Duncan. I met him over 10 years ago at a peace center in Northern Ireland, which is supported by the Corimila community. It's the island's oldest peace center and Duncan and Duncan's extended family have been intimately involved in its efforts for decades. He and I have been inside multiple conversations over the years and I have really come to trust and respect his analysis and his insights. Hopefully you've already read his abbreviated bio, which certainly doesn't do him justice. He is a polit politics lecturer, professor at Ulster University. So he, reached, he researches and he studies deeply the issues we'll be discussing. He's also very involved in policy and structural reform on the island throughout the UK and the world, sitting in front of government officials, even chairing commissions. And at the same time, if you were to follow him on Facebook, you'd know him to be a devoted spouse and father, a bicyclist who stops every so often to photograph and capture the beauty of that, that, uh, that island. He's a wonderful mixture of deep wisdom, kindness, and playfulness. You'll, you'll see the twinkle in his eye. We're glad he can spend this time with, together with us today. So welcome, Duncan. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Thanks, Terry. Nice, nice to see you again. So moving forward quickly, I thought we would have a conversation and people can listen in. And, and basically, there are four kind of groupings of things that I would like us to poke at. And I know you to be masterful. So just weave us through those things. What is going on? Why is it going on? What is the shape and the quality of peace in Northern Ireland? And I'd like us to, if we could, get to police reform, because I know it's been significant there and it is a significant issue here. So to begin with, we know the past is never just the past and that the present is never just the present, especially in the case of Northern Ireland. So here's my first question. Is Northern Ireland back to crisis? What's happening now and why is it happening? Well, I suppose um, your, your question goes to the heart at some level or other. Uh, we have seen violence back on the street. It has taken the pattern that we know and it has been in the places that we know. So at some level or other, it's impossible to overlook the parallels and to see and to make those parallels. And I suppose you talked at the beginning there about history. And uh, there is a joke uh, in Northern Ireland, which is a welcome to Belfast. Please turn back your watches 400 years. And what that is trying to say is that connections are made in time, that history is not dead, uh, that the patterns that were established for parents, grandparents, forefathers, and so on, reproduce themselves. And so people, without necessarily researching it, it's not a kind of an evidential-based thing, understand themselves within a pattern of history. And in some ways, even their whole sense of identity is tied up with the communities that have arisen in that conflict, with their sense not only of who they are, but who they're not. And uh, that has a very strong associations obviously with what they identify as, but also what they identify with. And I suppose the, the, the most important part of that is nationality, government, state, and so on. And as all of you will know, it's, it's filtered through uh, the combination of politics. So the role of Britain in Ireland, the way in which Britain was a polarizing influence rather than a uniting influence, uh, but it's also filtered through economics. We talked, you talked about justice. We talk about the reality, which is that was not a peaceful experience. It was a, there was land transfers. There were experiences in the economy, um, which have be, taken hundreds of years to wind through and are very much deeply embedded in the sense of 
justice and injustice and violence between those groups. So there's a sense of threat and there's a sense that we have to organize ourselves around that. And then there is on top of that, these religious elements, these things which religion played a very important role, not only in terms of giving an ideology, but more importantly, in binding the community together, giving it a sense of, of, of its own community and possibly most importantly, assuring people that they were the good guys. And so a lot of the violence has happened here on the basis of being good guys. So we've seen uh, Northern Ireland uh, back in this pattern. And I suppose uh, the, the, the difficult part of it is that, you know, we have in my life, I'm uh, nearly 60 now. And uh, in my life, we've seen it go from uh, a period of, of superficial calm but where there was a lot of things under the surface which exploded. We, uh, we had 30 years in my life when violence was uh, uh, really a daily experience. Um, and living in Belfast, I wasn't living in what, even in the heartland areas, but every day you heard bombs go off. That was a, a part of my childhood. Uh, then we had the peace process, which was now 23 years ago. And we signed an agreement, which was a really big international peace agreement. And the hope was that that would if you like, give us a new chance. And certainly it hasn't been the same in the last 20 years as the last 30 years. But the patterns, these sense of identity, the potential for tension to rise is still there and has, if you like, we, we, it, while we have, if you like, had what might be called in the, in the jargon, and I'm not always very happy with it, the, the negative piece, this idea that we got rid of violence and put structures around it. Um, that has happened. But our piece depends not just on a, a piece of separation or a piece of structure. It, it, it depends on us learning that we are in a future together. And actually, that's what's known in the jargon as the positive piece. Uh, it is the, the, the relationships which make these kind of hostile, uh, oppositional, friend and foe kind of identities no longer meaningful. And the truth is that uh, too much, while well, some change has happened, and I certainly wouldn't want to say no change has happened, but too much of that has been sustained. So what we are looking at, I suppose, has been, and it's been growing over the last uh, five years now, partly because of what we here call, I suppose, with this big sense of the Brexit process, the process of Britain trying to reassert its own independence in relation to the European Union. Uh, that has had huge impacts locally because it's divided people again on this question of who are we? And there's been special arrangements made for Northern Ireland within that Brexit process, but they are not uh, universally uh, liked. They weren't negotiated locally. And so for the last few months, we've seen rising tension. And that tension, I suppose, feeds its way through the very complex process of a society. But in this society, once again, you see it taking the same shape and the same form again. So. I wouldn't like to say we're back to the 1970s, but what I would like to say is that it does demonstrate that the issues that the 1970s, if you like, brought into the public space have still got the potential to create uh, violence, to polarize, and for a new generation to bring them into a sense of their identity being us against them, or more importantly, friends against foes. Thank you. I'm gonna, uh, Tie, moves us right into the next question that I would have. And um, it, you did go through this amazing process, this amazing peace process. And, and it seemed to finally end the period called the Troubles. I've heard some on the island herald the, the Good Friday or the Belfast Agreement as a near miracle, a model for the rest of the world. But as I have lived and I have worked in Northern Ireland, I still see walls that separate uh, communities. Uh, schools are still uh, separated. Families are struggling to put food on the table. Murals that remain defiant about identity. Police officers who are forced to live their personal lives in anonymity to keep them and their families safe. So what happened or didn't happen through that peace process? Tell us a little bit more about it. Well, first of all, um, one of the things that Northern Ireland can, can tell the world is uh, peace is an extremely complicated process. Peace is not simply the decision to have a political accommodation. Peace, if it means anything, has something to do with uh, the possibility to live freely without fear, 
but also to live and, and be able to flourish within the environment that you're in. And while uh, political um, interventions are clearly critical to that, and structural interventions are clearly critical to that, they are, in my experience, certainly from Northern Ireland, they're the floor on which you can build the future or not. They're not the ceiling of your ambitions. So I think one of the big lessons of the Good Friday Agreement and the Belfast process is understand your peace, uh, your peace deals not as the end, but as the turning of a page and the possibility of a new chapter. So that this idea of uh, addressing all of the things which led you to require a peace agreement in the first place um, is now possible, whereas previously it wasn't possible. So it's, it's, it's that kind of a watershed rather than, than, than a point of arrival and final um, moment. So let me just say a couple of things about the actual peace process. I mean, I subscribe to the view in many ways that from an international relations point of view, the Good Friday Agreement was really quite a miracle. Uh, it, it is not an exaggeration to say that most people really felt that, you know, uh, an accommodation between Unionists and Nationalists, Protestants and Catholics, British and Irish inside Ireland was really impossible and getting worse over the 30 years. Um, Northern Ireland came into existence, in fact, to try to separate them out. It didn't work. Uh, what Northern Ireland became was almost like a concentrated version of British and Irish history. Everybody else moved off. Um, and in about 1985, the, the governments came together and really, I think, in despair more than in any particular plan, uh, they came to the conclusion that if this was to finish, uh, it would require something imaginative and it would require something where it was about sharing and uh, some kind of future where uh, people would live together. And I think in that sense, uh, Northern Ireland is a really interesting experiment. It has to be said that the coming to the conclusion that you should share is something that is kind of obvious logically. It's obvious from a, from a, a room or a, a plan. But when sharing actually means um, I have to live with my enemy, I have to find a future with the very people who I'm most frightened of or who my whole culture tells me I can never trust, uh, then the, the process towards that is very hard. And division in Northern Ireland, I suppose, uh, what we've learned is it has it has so many dimensions. So uh, it is about identity. We don't uh, we we understand ourselves almost um, or have grown up to understand ourselves almost as incompatible others. So that uh, we talked about that. So it's, it's a it's an identity issue. So peace means actually I have to rethink my identity. Uh, it is also profoundly in the structures. It is profoundly in the structures. Uh, and that is structures in a socioeconomic sense, but it's also structures in Northern Ireland, for example, don't know if people know this, but our education systems have grown up in parallel. But even if you had the education together, uh, people live in separate zones. And the reality of that is we know our own experience. We know about the experience of the other through the filter of our own fears. And I think that that is a, that, that's really important because even if you meet those uh, suspicions, the protections that you have to put up are present in the intimate. So even if you meet, unless it really is a place where fear is set aside and we talk about safe places, but safe places really do mean safe places in relationships, safe places to really begin to expose some of our stories which we don't necessarily know. So we assume we know, but we really only know about. So those structures there, so it's identities, it's structures. Our behaviors are almost, are very strongly um, defined by this experience of suspicion and fear. So that, for example, people wouldn't go to certain places. They wouldn't say certain things in certain contexts. They would uh, not want to disclose information you said about police officers who had to live in secrecy. So somebody might not want to tell a story about what their father's or mother's profession was. Uh, and that's a very deep experience for a child, which is carried into every aspect of their life. But it may also mean, for example, that, you know, we talk about mixed marriages in Northern Ireland, meaning for us across that divide. But the mix is 
the mix of people who shouldn't mix friends and foes and that's that's the defining issue it can be a, i suppose in some places it's an issue of of race or color in other places an issue of nationality or language for us it was this issue of usually filtered through religion so identity structures behaviors and then all of our attitudes are shaped in those frames and then reproduce support for the same structures support for the same behaviors and support for the same identities so the good friday agreement incredibly complex created a huge international um, coalition for peace was incredibly flexible i mean northern ireland for example we have uh, uh, uh something came out of the agreement was you can be british irish or both so that means citizens of the state citizens of the other state or citizens of both states must be treated equally and it is as you may choose so that is almost like what america did with religion you know it's it's a, it's a personal choice that nationality is almost secularized if you like uh but we can be british today irish tomorrow that's allowed us and we have to be treated equally under the law that's written down uh, other aspects they produced hugely complex political things human rights is written through like uh the through a, a stick of you know sweetie rock it's it, it's it's like letters that are, are written through it and we have to go through it and so all of these things are built in but you still need people to work it equality for example is a big virtue but asking people to treat as equal people they fear is really really complicated because it's not even that people don't want to it is as soon as they do somebody up the road says why are you letting those people live in those houses because uh, actually you're putting us at risk and all of a sudden it's not that i don't want to it's i'm frightened of the people in my own neighborhood who will come to me and so these these the potential for fear and suspicion to reproduce itself i think should not be underestimated what I would say is the agreement gave us opportunities. It certainly loosened things up. It has created a new generation of people who have a different experience. And it didn't do so against the blank page. It did so against all of the stuff I'm talking about. So the last 20 years in many ways have been this interaction between what's known from the past. And some of these things are in individuals they're not just in, in communities, it's both sides. So I want, to look into a new future. I'll take a few risks, but I'm also going to keep some of that safety or some people moving one way, some people moving the other. But I just want to say it's complicated and particularly issues have proved difficult about the past. In other words, uh, uh, we, we, we're in a, a conundrum here about what happened in the past, because if you don't mention it, it sits there like a kind of a horrible presence at the table if you do mention it the potential is it leads to a kind of trading of injury and in fact makes the relationships worse so one of the things that people um talk about coming here in personal behavior is people work out who else is in the room i work in the university the university is one of the most shared spaces in the whole of uh, Northern Ireland. It was never segregated. I teach politics, so I'm right in the heart of that conversation. Uh, but people uh, have to work out what they say. And we don't have the, the issue of skin color to make any mechanism to decide people. So people use other codes. They, you know, There are things which uh, people hold within their own cultures, where you live, where you went to school, different names, and people work out and, and they do so within, I don't know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. My wife came from outside Northern Ireland. She said, I'll never do that. Within a year and a half, she is part of that process. Not because she's frightened herself, but just because everybody does that. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is a peace project is a lifetime project. It has to provide space for a, a series of dimensions. It is a revolution. P if your norm, is protect yourself against the other peace is the unknown future and therefore we have to help our way through it because we don't know it it's almost like i remember being at a business uh, course where the guy said to me if it feels uh familiar it's probably wrong <laughs> if it feels unfamiliar 
it's probably heading in the right direction. But to ask people to live with unfamiliarity for a long period of time without support is a challenge, is a challenge. All right, thank you for that. I would love to push into that conversation more and maybe in the Q&A, someone will raise it about then if there is a reason for fear, there's good reason to distrust, distrust. there's history of violation and disgrace and uh, humiliation. Why would we trust? Then what is the way forward uh, at a social and psychological and maybe spiritual? Uh, the, what are those pathways? But I, we only have 10 more minutes and I want to make sure to get to policing because um, I don't want to be a lawyer today and, and just look over at, at the Emerald Island and say, oh, look at the, you know, look at those sods, <laughs> you know, because we got a lot going on in this country, as you know. And, um, and, and I know that um, as part of the Good Friday agreement, um, there was a section in there that uh, uh, encouraged police or it said we we're going to do some police reform because that was a, a challenge. Um, and, and so uh, and then about a year later, I believe that there was a, a commission report called the, the patent report that came out with um, findings and suggestions or uh, recommendations for significant structural transi uh, transitions. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what we might be able to learn here. No, we're different countries with different kinds of issues, but it, we're still human at the end of the day. So. Um, what happened there when you sh you shifted from the RUC to the PSNI? Wonder if you could tell us if there's any sort of connections or lessons learned that we might want to consider as we're really struggling that with police and um, policing and police reform here in the states. Absolutely, and I mean again, all of these topics could could uh, have entire courses. So uh, I'll try to be as as I suppose. Um, the reality of the police is they go to something really central is that they, the, the thing that they have um, that d defines them is the right to enforce. And that enforcement uh, and that right, if it's tied up uh, with, a, with a, a political community which is contentious, where there is no agreement, and in Northern Ireland it really was, uh, the, the, the debate about Northern Ireland was Northern Ireland should exist, Northern Ireland should not exist. So the people who wanted it to exist, or to be or not to be, that is the question. Um, the uh, so the police grow out of the political system that exists, um, and in, in in a deep sense, they are the kind of human face of of the law, of the system, and so they are both the people who, uh, in their interactions, define that law, but they also receive on the other side, the uh, on a personal level, some of the things which are actually about the whole society. So they they're like a microcosm. Um, and the police in Northern Ireland were very much grew out of the state. That meant they were seen as part of the enforcement mechanism of the state. Now, they will, of course, say, you know, in ordinary everyday life, they weren't doing anything wrong. And that's true at some level. But at another level, they were very much identified as the human face of, this, of, of the government, of the state, of the system. Uh, and that meant that they, they also were drawn largely from the supporters of that group. They were seen as effectively carrying that out. Now, from their own point of view, they said, we do it under law, it's all public, it's all transparent, we're different, we're not just any old group. But the truth is that uh, by the 1970s, they had got tied into uh, trying to police a society which was deeply contentious. One of the answers, of course, was more law, uh, more policing. But while that kind of held the situation at one level, and uh, they, on another level, it simply maintained the confrontation and put the police right at the front. So as you say, it, it actually increased the problem, which was people only coming from one background. And that thing we talked about uh, between communities where once that kind of enmity starts to happen, the hard borders between people mean that increasingly people don't know anything about each other. The Catholic community, uh, the Republican community is the same thing, knew very little about who the police were. The police, as far as they were concerned, were an occupying force from outside who came in on top of them, told them what to do. Uh, meanwhile, the police said, we come under unprovoked attack. There is no warning. There's all sorts of weaponry. The 300 police officers were killed in Northern Ireland in a very short period. And so it became a really enormous issue. And it also ties people emotionally uh, to these incidents. 
for the people who support the police, the police are the bravest people in the world. They're the people on the front line supporting us, making sure that we're safe. For the people on the other side, they're the visible face of the aggression of the state. And if that becomes a pattern, then, and when there's no conversation and no sense of consent, that is a, 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 that's a really difficult position. So the police and police reform became a central topic of the peace process. The difficulty, of course, was they couldn't actually discuss it in the sense that they all knew that it had to be reformed. But if they got around the table, it was a, it was a really difficult one because this wasn't just about theories. This was about people. This was about how, who was going to win and who was going to lose. So Patton, who was a, had been the governor of, conform, uh, of Hong Kong, uh, in the context of the peace process, they agreed the terms of reference. This must do the following things. It must be accountable, it must be representative, it must be effective, and it must be able to uh, be uh, work with the community. And that is revolution itself, because by the end of the 1990s, the police was about security. It was about uh, winning in the context of uh, increasingly violent uh, confrontation. And what Patton said, no, actually policing isn't actually something that belongs to the police. It's not the definition of policing is not what the police do. It's how we collectively keep our community in order. So the police are to policing what doctors are to health. In other words, health is not what doctors are not the same as health. They serve health, but health belongs to the whole community. So policing belongs to the whole community and how we do it and how the, what the role of the police within it ultimately has to return to the whole community. And so if you have a crisis about policing, the, the, what Patton's first thing was, the real crisis is actually the relationship between the community and the police. So here we have a new opportunity, which is we have to start again. And actually what Northern Ireland had, which was quite unusual, was I suppose uh, a chance to start again because we got this moment where, and Patton and his commission redesigned the police to a series of um, almost ideal criteria, uh, but they were given these things. And so they, they said, for example, you know, uh, human rights is the purpose of policing. That's what they actually said. It was as simple as that, is to uphold human rights. That is what we want our police to do, to make sure that everybody in this community has, all the, has these rights. Second of all, they must do this through what they called not policing with the community. Now that wasn't community policing, it's a, it's a difficult language. What they actually meant was, you know something, uh, every single thing the police have to do from domestic violence to traffic stops is uh, something which the community may help with. So it may be, for example, in domestic violence, it's victim support. It's organizations working in the community to uh, get, get evidence. It is uh, working with uh, other profession, uh, education, working with schools, all of these kind of things. So policing as a whole, yes, the police have a function, but it's not the whole story. So policing, they said, that's the way you should approach all issues from hate crime to drugs. It's the police have their role, but they should be working with everybody else. So they set up structures to enable partnership and they set up structures to look at how in different localities that would, that would work out. But that it focused the police on saying, first of all, human rights is at the core of what we have to do. And second of all, uh, policing with the community is one of the tests of what we have to do. And they then went through a process of, of a series of interventions, for example, to make the police more representative, which was very important for us, to ensure that discipline and complaints were done on an independent basis. And effectively, it was a root and branch change, most importantly from the purpose of, of policing is security from to the purpose of uh, policing is safeguarding our peace. <laughs> That is its purpose. So it's the difference between parenting, which is about getting the children to be quiet, and parenting, which is an essential part of ensuring that the whole family can live together. And it's not a question of saying we can have parenting or we can't. Uh, it is a question of saying there's something called parenting, which has the child at the middle and which understands that the purpose of the parent is ultimately the service of the child. <laughs> and in exactly that same way. So, now, I have to say, having said that, what I would say, and I'll complete, and I know there may be questions about this, but the, the thing to, to just say about that is the last 20 years, I suppose, like everything else in Northern Ireland, 
have been a journey between the experience of the community, which is still looking for protection against each other, and the police in the middle of that, and the conversation that has to go on. But if you want a measure of success, the police have not killed anybody in Northern Ireland for 20 years. So uh, that is a measure. And the number of, of, of police officers killed uh, is um, two. So uh, the, it's, it's been, a, been a, in that sense, a huge change. That doesn't mean that policing has not remained a huge issue, that issues around policing in the past, and I can cover all of that. So I don't want to give you this picture, which is that it's perfect. What I would want to say to you is that I think we have had a talk which put policing in the, in the middle of our conversation to allow us to begin to talk about who we were ourselves and some of our successes and failures are best illustrated in some of the changes and unchanges that have continued to happen in policing. Thank you. We've got two more minutes and then Trey is going to magically appear, but that just sounds amazing. And I know it's not, I know it's not perfect, Duncan, but I think it's the, the, it, the structure is really, really shifted over the course of time. So what are a couple of the first steps? If we were really to take reform seriously and address some of the very same issues and challenges that you face or were facing in Northern Ireland, what are a couple of ways, could you give us a couple ideas or pathways for how we might encourage that sort of shift ourselves? I would say um, there were, a number of things which were certainly important in our process and this is a story rather than telling you what to do first of all i think there was a bit of politics which had to be done which is what do we want our police to be able to do so there was a bit of, of uh, in the good friday agreement it was really important to set the terms of reference and in a sense um there wasn't a disagreement about that. People wanted the police to be honest. They wanted the police to be able to be accountable. They wanted the police to be approachable. They wanted the police to be part of the community. They wanted the, all of these things. At the level of language, those were common agreements. What was in dispute was, we're doing this already, or you're absolutely opposite of this. <laughs> but we were able to agree that. So that was quite useful. A bit of politics about just the principles. Second one was, I think importantly, uh, the insiders and outsiders. In other words, there was a good mix of people who did that, who were really rooted in the reality of the situation, but also people who knew something about these realities from outside. So that dialogue kept everybody a bit honest in the, in the commission. Third one was their process was very, very um, public. In other words, they did things that nobody had ever done. They ran a whole series of public meetings. They had to do a listening exercise. They had to reflect what they heard. They they did some quite dangerous things. Actually, they went into places where nobody had had public conversations about this, and uh, they, you know, for quite a long time, I have to say, there was months involved in that. You know, that that was quite a thing. And then maybe the fourth, the they they stuck then in the hard decisions to the principles. They had to show how the the practical met the principles. And very last, I suppose, is, you know, they needed to appoint good people to see it through. They needed, and, and, and so uh, that was very important in, in the end and still is, you know, uh, you do need good leadership in some of these things. So we had uh, two, three things, the oversight group, the, the policing board, who are meant to be the representatives of the community, uh, which was one of the ways they came over it. The um, police chiefs uh, were really quite enlightened and good people and the uh, complaints, the new complaints procedure, which is entirely independent of the police, it's called the Police Ombudsman's Office. There were some really, uh, you know, strong people in the middle of that. And, and just a focus, which may be a financial focus sometimes, but it's certainly a focus. And you may need to get, I mean, and, and, the, and holding the communities as they change in this is difficult. And uh, that is, requires political leadership, that requires the buy-in of people who are going to do it. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Duncan. I'm going to hand it over to you, Trey, until the very end. Thank you, Terry, and thank you, Duncan. Um, just to jump right in, we have an anonymous question here um, from a, an OSU alum and former staff that's joining from Columbus, and they noticed that you, Duncan, refer to the sentiments between the two groups as fear rather than hate, and is this intentional, and why, and if so, what is the difference? Ha. Huh. 
Um, good question, of course. Um, the boundary between the two isn't always very clear, uh, actually, and some of it is anger. Um, uh, but what it is is um, a profound sense that the other is is against me, uh, is not for me, and that can take different shapes. But all of them require protection, um, and uh, some of it, I mean, is fear. That's true, and I think that at a at a generic level, um, people who are not the, if you like, the the first um, process in the first line. It's not necessarily hatred. It may be a generalized sense of I have to, I just have to avoid the situation or this person's out to get me. I think, for example, though, it can be hatred. It can be a deep hatred, which is uh, that I have experienced things in my life which I will never, ever be able to uh, uh, let go and which have marked me and have, uh, which, and, and, and very often, and here's the terrible truth is as the violence accumulates, there's more of those. There are more of those. Part of the difficulty with violent response is that uh, it generates more and more reasons to be violent. That is the, the, the huge dilemma because the, the claim is it gets us out of it. That's true if it's quick. If it's not quick, uh, it certainly doesn't. It, it, it reproduces itself and creates more of it. So uh, good question. Uh, I would at a general level say um, the the issues are probably all present in different times. People are fearful, angry, and hateful, and they move between those things. It probably, for me, as a, as a, as a political driver, has something to do with either a deep anger about a previous situation, so a kind of injustice feel, or deep fear about what the consequences of that are going to be. And between those two, I think um, I would just want to say we need to listen to each other. Excellent. Thank you. And Lizzie Fitzgerald, who is also an alumni of Ohio State, a 1980 graduate, asks if you can discuss the marches in marching season and how that seems to keep things stirred up. Um, she mentions that she once uh, saw these marches and it seemed like pouring gas on a fire. Um, so what is the purpose of these marches and why do they persist? Yes, well, I mean, uh, for those of you who don't know, every summer we have this period when uh, particularly now, it wasn't always so, but now on one side of the community, the Protestant community, they, they march uh, in their organization called the Orange Order, which does, they don't march in a in military formation, but they do walk through the streets and uh, at points where they're walking through areas which are uh, got large Catholic populations, these become sometimes very contentious and can lead to all sorts of things, including riots. So that's just a description very quickly of what happened. Okay, here's the issue. Um, what counts as culture um, begins to be the things we do that we self-organize. And this, uh, at the local level, this dispute about the state um, and this sense of identity uh, crystallizes, it crystallized into organizations which often had military or paramilitary beginnings, which were defensive organizations for the community. Um, and they uh, march or they in Northern Ireland they march ritually to uh, remember those things so it, one of their slogans is remember 1690 which was the last time we won the big battle uh, and the parading function basically takes them onto the streets uh, from the people who are not part of their organization who are essentially the Catholic community this is like an invasion as yeah sorry I forgot the first name of the, of the question asker but um, as, as you said it is a, uh, it's pouring fuel in the fire. It's pouring fuel in the fire. On the other side, it is, uh, we are, as we parade peacefully through these areas, we get attacked. So therefore it becomes the lightning conductors. These people are still out to get us. They're out to destroy our culture. And so this issue of my freedom to march on the street as I see fit uh, in a peaceful way is now treated as pouring fuel in the fire and legitimizes people attacking me. If you look at the other side of that, it is these people who have a history of oppressing us are now marching again through our areas and oppressing us again. The point is, of course, that uh, the persistent doing of this raises every summer the possibility that every time, particularly with political tension, these events will become the lightning conductor, where people who might otherwise not be there start to turn up. And the greater the tensions in the community, the more likely that is. 
So uh, what we've come to laterally in the last 20 years is there's another commission for that. There's a thing called the Parades Commission and the Parades Commission, you have to apply to it. And if there are issues with the route or issues with who's on the parade or issues with what is going to be said, they have to regulate that. And the police may have to just simply carry out what they decide. Um, the, the, uh, the issue of what rights are engaged, what human rights are engaged in that contest are very heavily disputed and they have uh, gone to court at various times but mostly they're decided by the parades commission and the, they the court puts it back and says it's whatever the parades commission decides so i i suppose if you're asking me personally i uh, i agree that they uh these are extremely difficult uh, and extremely complex issues which who's where the 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 violence that, that is in the history of these events is really impossible to oversee in certain contexts. On another side, uh, the issue to suppress them simply gets a response from the other side, which is you're trying to crush my culture, you're trying to destroy that culture. So uh, we are, it, it becomes one of the most contentious issues, one of the ways in which, even in spite of a peace agreement, the habits that we have continue to throw, as you said, petrol on the fire every year. Thank you, Duncan. Um, Nancy Rogers, who works with the Divided Communities Project and with the, the law school here, um, asks about generational splits and, and what has, so first of all, are there generational splits and what has worked to overcome them? There are clearly generational splits and some of those generational splits are um, caused by um, the experience of war and peace. My generation uh, lived through violence at a very regular and, and intimate level. This was part of who we were. You know, as I said, shootings and bombings were every day, and we basically found our way to tiptoe around them. And to and it's strange, even those riots, for example. Those of you, I'm sure it's it's very similar to experiences of, of shooting in American cities. If you're in the middle of them, they're 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 very present and they're absolute. They have through the media a huge effect for everybody. But the if you don't live near them, you have to hear about them from second hand. But they still affect your life. They they start especially as they accumulate and they become part of a bigger story. Um. So the generation who who grew up since 1998 have not known that same regularity of events. Um, and I would say there's been a bit of a split. Uh, and part of that has to do with class and economics and education. For some people in, in the higher educated groups, and it, it, I suppose there's, um, uh, there are shadows of this clearly in the US and in Britain and in other places at the moment, where the educated walk away. They are somehow or other, they don't want to know about this. They kind of slightly disdain what's going on in there. And certainly their interests are different. Their interests have been green politics uh, in recent years, Black Lives Matter, in issues around uh, gay rights and so on. So those have been the kind of driving focuses of them, social change. And so there is a split within that generation though. There are, on the other hand, other people who still live in the middle of communities where those issues appear foreign and the only issue that's real is the old issue. And the riots have taken place in those places where young children are coming out in, in those settings. So it's, it's, it's a generational split, but it is, if you like, mediated also by where you live. And so one of the uh, interesting questions, I suppose that, and interesting is probably just a bit of an academics word, but one of the questions we don't know is how will this generation experience these riots again? Because they are not the same generation as were there before. Um, how will they respond? Will they respond in the same way as the last generation did, polarizing? Or because of the polarizing in my generation, will they in fact react the other way and say, we don't wish this? So um, it's a little early to tell, as the one historian said, the future is not my period. But the uh, it is it is nevertheless, uh, she's right. Um, some of the issues with generation are, are really are really going to be important and crucial because it's a different lens and a different prism. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tom Murphy, who is a 1973 graduate of Ohio State who lives in Portland currently and is interested in racial injustice in the US, um, he sort of asked the, the big million dollar question, which is, 
what are the most important characteristics of peace and reconciliation processes that have proven effective? And what are the telling characteristics of such processes that have not produced positive results? Well, I, I, I think um, there's so many answers to that. Um, we uh, did, you know, so Northern Ireland has been so over-researched that we kind of know quite a lot of this. So there are elements of this in, in theory. Uh, in the sense that we, we, we kind of know what the agenda is if you're really looking for some kind of uh, way out of this and way, way, some kind of viable shared future. Um, so uh, the, the themes, and these are only thematic because in the end, each one of them is contentious, is what does a shared future actually look like? What's the balance of power? What does that actually look like? Is it something we can even contemplate? Uh, the second one, I think, is how do we deal with uh, the legacy of the past, which commits us to relationships of suspicion. How is that? How is that going to be changed? So, how, how does those those issues unpick? The third one is the socioeconomics of this, which is what are the structural and socioeconomic issues which have to change if we are to find or to even believe it at all that this is a society which is embracing of all the people living in it. So that is another set of big things. The question you touched on there, culture, you know, how do we not uh, simply ritually re-express our divisions all the time? What does that look like? Um, and, and where and, and then the, the, the million dollar one, if people live very apart, and I mean by that structurally and mentally and culturally and societally apart, often for, for very good reasons. In other words, they're inheriting history. So this isn't a, about judgment. But how are openings made? Where are openings made that we can build relationships? Can we find issues on which we cooperate in a different way? Can we collaborate in another way? Can children in education really be encouraged to, to think through some of this stuff? Can we work in some of the most difficult areas to produce um, uh, ways to do things differently? So in, in interfaces, for example, not anymore to see each other as, as oppositional, but actually to collaborate on bringing economic regeneration to these areas and so on. So that is all, uh, those are all themes. Just, uh, uh, I'm going to say another thing as well. I think it requires change to structure. I think it requires change to uh, our habits and the kind of unthinking ways we do our business and ritual. So some of the challenging around that and some of the thinking around that and some of how we bring it together. I think our stories of who we are are going to be challenged and that's really tough. So there's a, a kind of rethinking that and all in the course of doing that, I think um, who we are is going to be challenged because so often we're defined by our conflict. Uh, so really these have been uh, huge issues. As a, as a way into it, um, it depends. I mean, I think there are certain structural frames which create possibilities uh, for and platforms. And I think that's where the, via, the value of treaties and basic foundational uh, agreements around laws and so on are really are utterly critical. Um, so equality law has been very important for us. Human rights spread the framework for us. They're, they're absolutely crucial. And, and I think um, not everything will be resolved by law. Most things happen in life are resolved uh, between people uh, when the law can't intervene. Um, I, I chaired a commission in Scotland on hate crime. And what became really clear was it wasn't even the crimes that were the big thing. They were obvious and awful and had to be dealt with. It was that what happened between crime and, and ordinary street and ordinary life. In other words, what we now call hate incidents, small things, people insulting each other, people uh, uh, putting each other down, people refusing each other basic uh, rights or basic equality, refusing each other, uh, spitting at each other in our case, you know, uh, all these kind of things, uh, small things which accumulated into this sense of alienation. And so that has to be dealt with at more than just the legal, more than just the structural. That's not an anti-structural point, by the way. That's not an anti-legal point. It is both and, or those things and, I think is, is, is where I would come down on that. 
Great, thank you, Duncan. And for, I think the final question probably, there's a collection of, of comments in the chat related to Brexit. Um, so what role is Brexit playing in intensifying things right now, um, et cetera? So any response or description of what's going on with Brexit? I, it, this is happening and this is quite personal, I suppose. So I, full disclosure, I uh, totally oppose Brexit. <laughs> However, having said that, try to be a little bit of an academic around this. Um, the, the first thing I suppose is for me is that the Good Friday Agreement, the peace process that we made was dependent on an entirely new relationship between Britain and Ireland. What was new about the peace process? What is the breakthrough of the agreement? Was that two states, instead of pushing their, if you like, egotistical push actually managed to say no something's more important here finding a way for these people to live together is more important and while you can poo poo that and you can say it was for all real a lot of real political reasons it's really important that the two countries decided that rather than letting people kill each other they put their resources into trying to find a livable solution so that's the first thing the european union uh provided a framework within which that was actually relatively easy because there were lots of laws within the European Union, for example, about borders and trade and so on, which without having to be reinvented for Ireland already existed. And so they could rely on those to make that collaboration feel real. So going across borders, as soon as there was peace, there was no obstacle to going across borders. Some very unusual things happened in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, for example, the president of Ireland, which is technically not the sovereign state, uh, used to travel or has been for the last 20 years traveling to Northern Ireland without any ceremony whatsoever and opening things and being at things and doing things. That kind of ease of kind of informal arrangement to allow people to simply find their, their way into the future. These were very unusual things. Brexit um, is almost the opposite of that. Instead of trying to find ways to ease people finding their identity and, and making new new connections and new hybrids of their own uh, set. It, it wasn't intended. It was intended as Britain and England in particular wanting away from being uh, controlled by consensus decisions in, in Brussels. So there was this wish, which we don't want to be told what to do. Uh, that's not sovereignty. The difficulty in Ireland is that Northern Ireland only functions if we have a collaborative consensus based process. And I think they only discovered that afterwards. They basically said, uh, we want a hard border we want and a hard border means a border within which there's a strict line between what applies outside and what applies inside um, and a hard border in ireland meant in international relations terms re-putting the border across the island of ireland and just to tell you how complex that is uh, the eastern frontier of the european union in russia right if you go from the top of russia right down to turkey has 110 crossings, official crossings. The Irish border has 275. So controlling that is a massive invasion of what is essentially an organic community. Around that community is, uh, uh, that particular area is entirely uh, against the border. So we'd subvert it and it brings back all sorts of this historic pattern of resistance and violence. And so what has happened is uh, the, that became the huge issue. The outcome is then, well, there has to be a border. Where is it going to be? The decision was that actually that putting that border in Ireland was totally impossible. And therefore, that border has remained open. And instead, they have then decided that the controls and all of the things will happen between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Now, that only happened in January. We are still in the middle of COVID. We're just coming out of the lockdown period. As we speak tomorrow, they're opening all the shops again. So we it's been very quiet. But the implications for unionism symbolically are we've been kicked out of our own country. Uh, but for everybody else, if the only alternative is a border on the island of Ireland, then in fact, we have to live with this border, uh, this customs border. Uh, the implications, of course, are that over time, uh, not in the immediate, we, all our supply chains at the moment run through the United Kingdom, or a lot of them do. but over time, if it's easier to get it through Ireland and the European Union, will that happen? So for unionists, there's a fear that even a success for Northern Ireland economically starts to look like tying it more closely into the economy of the Irish Republic and therefore taking them in that direction. The difficulty, and I'll go back to it, is 
Brexit meant there had to be a border. The Good Friday Agreement was about how do you make a peace which minimizes those borders, which opens out around those things. And so at a deep fundamental level, managing Brexit has really destabilized the relationship that was established of or that was at least hoped for of a partnership uh, inside Northern Ireland between uh, the two sides of the community or the two dominant political uh, versions of what the future should be. And it has put them into competition again. Um, and that, that, has, that is really one of the ways in which feeding through all sorts of other things, that leads to deep disquiet. It leads to the revitalization of, of military organizations and it's part of the process anyway of how those um, riots that we were talking about at the very beginning happened. So it is the story of now, the, just to absolutely finish, I know we've run over, but just to um, absolutely finish on this, what happens with Brexit will probably be the story of the next few years. In other words, this process is technically completed, but we are living through its aftermath. And how it works through is probably what you should watch uh, in Northern Ireland because it puts demands back on the British government, puts demands on the European Union. The European Union is, is has taken responsibilities in Northern Ireland, but has no real history of trying to manage these kind of situations. The uh, British government is determined to have a hard border, but that means having a hard border in Ireland, but they don't want to acknowledge that. So uh, are they prepared to modify their hard uh, Brexit border? All of those things are right on the table. And if you live here, I have to say, it does feel a little bit like peace at this stage means trying to find your way in the middle of things which you don't yourself control that you're trying to uh, still maintain this notion that us finding a shared future within this is the most important dimension. And I'll leave it at that. Well, I think we need another couple hours, Duncan. So thank you so much for spending time with us today. I mean, we have border issues, we have police issues, they're different, but they're the same. Um, it's, it's really easy to matrix jump between what's happening on the island and here in the United States. And to see the beauty and fr the fragility that's happening there and to understand our own beauty and fragility. Um, I think we are uh, caught at times inside of our histories and our cultures, our identities and stories. And, and sometimes it's really hard to see things differently. What you've shared, at least for me, pokes at us. Um, it's, so hearing about you helps me to wrestle and reflect a little bit about you know how we are the same so thanks for spending time with us and for those of you that attend today thanks for joining us um and uh duncan again we're just so grateful to to to, to learn from your wisdom and to the rest of you have a great day and duncan i'll see you soon great thank you very much sir bye bye bye, bye. Thanks, everybody.